Welcome to Kirby Connects, where our goal is to help you read through the Bible with some understanding so you don't get discouraged and quit. Speaking of not being discouraged and quitting, we have in the room Clayton Kerr. I just about said Taylor Kerr. Clayton Kerr. <laughs> Uh, Yang could, her, that, would that would be interesting, and myself, Pastor Mike. Hey, listen, um, we are rapidly, uh, sell or well, not rapidly, we have approached the halfway mark. This is our 26th podcast of Kirby Connects, helping you to read through the Bible, and I hope you are staying faithful to it. And again, if you haven't, or those that you started reading with and they've kind of fallen off the wagon, just say, let's start and let's finish the second half of the year, 26 to go. Matter of fact, if you have kept up, if you have kept up with all the reading this year, if you see Clayton Sunday, all right, he'll give you a gift card for, for a Dairy Queen. We always give it to the kids. We'll give you just a way to celebrate, just to go, wow, and we'll mention it again Sunday. But now you got to be on the honor system. He might give you a quiz. I don't know. He may do something. <laughs> a little Bible trivia, <laughs> little Bible trivia, just to hold you accountable. But, uh, but anyway, we're thankful for you that have followed along with us and continue reading uh, God's Word. We are doing this actually the week of the 4th. It will drop on um, July the 11th. So this is July 4th weekend, so I just thought we would talk about a couple of traditions, July 4th traditions, and, uh, and what they are. My first question, before we get to kind of like what were your July 4th traditions, or what do you remember most about July 4th growing up, was Joey Chestnut. Oh, man. Jo you know Joey Chestnut? You don't know who Joey Chestnut is? Oh, the hot dog guy. The hot dog guy. guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you went up with against Joey Chestnut, how many hot dogs, how many minutes do they have? Like 10? Five? I forgot. I'm not up to code on the rules and regulations of hot dogs. <laughs> of hot dog eating. Nobody don't, times me. Don't, nobody down. really times you out. Yeah. Let's just say it's, it's, it's three minutes. Because I don't think. Oh. Oh. How many hot dogs do you think you can wolf down in three minutes? Hot dog and bun. Oh, man. Hot dog and bun in three minutes. Three minutes. I'd say two. Two? Uh, no, I eat a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Not as much as him. I am confident that Ying would beat me. Yeah. <laughs> so, so how many? I don't know, because it's like, because it's Just weird. give me a number. Probably seven or six or five or maybe. Three. Seven? Maybe. Let's go with seven. I think we need to <laughs> do need this. To we up. need to make this a pot. Uh, we need to do this as a, <laughs> a post, a FaceTime post. Oh Joey Yang Chestnut here at Kirby. <laughs> seven um, in three minutes. Seven in oh. three minutes. Dude, I could do maybe two. I, I'm not a big, I like, I like the hot dog without the bun. Yeah. You know, but you got to eat the bun with the hot dog to be, you know, Joey Yang chestnut, you know, oh, with, with seven in three minutes. I can't wait to see this. I think, I think this needs to be a camp thing. When you guys go to church camp, I think this should be a, I'm telling you. I, I think this has got real possibilities. Maybe a sermon illustration. Oh, Yang has already entered in one food eating contest this summer. <laughs> what food eating contest? How do I do not know about this? He was pretty miserable afterwards. Was, uh, <laughs> big old giant pho uh, pho challenge. I ended up losing a pho it. challenge. Pho challenge. So tell people what that is. It's oh, P H O. It's yep. a big giant Vietnamese uh, beef broth with rice noodles, and then you got like thin slice of beef and then uh, some brisket in there. So, so it's really, really Two good. pounds of noodles and two but pounds of beef? It was supposed to be two pounds of noodles and two pounds of meat. I personally thought they put like four or three pounds of noodles in there. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Just saying. I ate like 75% like of it. Lost. I ate 75% yeah. of it, but then, oh my goodness, I couldn't. I couldn't no more. I yeah. couldn't. Were you there? No. It was me, Frank, no. and Deidre. I yeah. asked him to hang out that night, and he said, oh. <laughs> so what's wrong, buddy? He told me about his challenge and how miserable. It's the felt. first time I never wanted to see a boat ever. <laughs> oh man! All right. Well, the Joey Chestnut is Chestnut Challenge is on. If you think you can eat more than seven hot dogs in three minutes, throw the gauntlet down. Yes, Yang, Yang, and the challenger. Yes, oh, yes. Yang will accept all challengers. All challengers. That'll be so much fun. 
All right, well, listen, let's jump into God's Word. Halfway through, we are coming to this critical moment in the nation of Israel's history. Um, as, you, as you're reading along, it was one nation that Moses led out of Israel. Um, Moses passed off leadership to Joshua. Joshua began the time of the judges. Uh, Israel wanted a king, and so they were one nation under Saul and David. And then David, it started to splinter, and by the time Solomon came, it was, it was and Solomon's children took over, you had a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. The northern kingdom was the ten tribes that comprised what is called Israel. Now, that's not the collective Israel. This is just the ten tribes or families of Jacob that hung together in the northern area of, of the Middle East there around Israel that time. And then the two other family units, uh, Judah and Benjamin, they were known as the tribe of Judah, and that are the the kingdom of Judah, and that's where Jesus came from, and that was, that was his lineage. By the time you read this week from 2 Kings chapter 9 to 2 Kings chapter 22, you will read through the demise of Israel. Now, it gets a little complicated again because you bounce back and forth from the king of Judah to the king of Israel to the king of Judah to the king of Israel. They are not one and the same. They are not the same. It's not the same landmass that is in dispute. They're two completely different kingdoms, and by the time you get to 2 Kings 22, the, the northern kingdom, Israel, will be, will be gone. Uh, the demise of Israel will happen. You'll have some references to it, but it, it will really just be um, no political standing, and it just will be overrun with the enemy, and, and it just, in a matter of time, just fall barren and waste. And so you have this exciting story. Jehu is made king, and Jehu uh, is an obedient servant of God. He was anointed king, and no sooner was he anointed king, his troops set out at God's command, verses chapter 9 and verse 7, and they quickly killed Joram, Ahaz, and Jezebel. He aggressively sought out and killed the rest of Ahab's family in keeping with Elijah's prophecy. Now, Elijah, Ahab, and Jezebel are one of the coolest stories in the entire Bible. Elijah and Ahab, Ahab tries to kill Elijah, and Elijah has this prophecy from God, and he says, the dogs of Jezreel, you know, where will eat your flesh, you know, and, and lick your blood by the walls of Jezreel and Naboth's vineyard. And it was just like, yeah. And so for years, there was no dogs barking in the entire kingdom of Israel because, you know, he totally believed Elijah. They got a little slack, got a little lazy. And the prophet uh, anointed Jehu, the next king. Jehu went in and he started to attack um, Jezreel. And that was the city where Jezebel and Ahab ruled from. And they sent messengers out and said, hey, do you come in peace? And he said, if you're not for us, you're against us. And they killed those messengers and they just went to the, to the city. Ahab came out. Anyway, he died in the chariot. Kind of his cool story. Unknown soldiers took an arrow, shot it in the air, and the hand of God took it, pierced right between his armor, and he died in the chariot. And so the battle is over and the chariot tier, the driver of the chariot, takes the chariot uh, to the well after they take out the body of Ahab and he is uh, getting I guess the cleaning stuff and buckets and to his amazement and just utter horror when he turns around he sees the dog of Jezreel licking the blood of Ahab off of his chariot it is just this story and then to finish it up so now Jehu is coming and it's a cool story because, you know, Jezebel just thinks, and this is where we kind of get the phrase Jezebel, she gets all gussied up and prettied up and she, you know, paints her face and she fixes her hair and puts on, you know, perfume and becomes very seductive. And so she, you know, talks out the castle window to Jehu 
And Jay said, if you four is, you know, take her and throw her out of the window, and they do, and they pick her up, and she plummets to her death. Jehu and the army just go into Jezreel. They trample her body over the horses and the chariots. It is just all mangled up. The day is done. They've routed, um, they've routed Ahab and his people and his army and what was left of, of Jezebel. And so it's that night they're having dinner, and somebody says she is a king, or she is of the royalty, and he said, Jehu said, you're right, go bury her. And when they went outside the walls of Jezreel to get her body, they only found the skull and her hands because the dogs of Jezreel had eaten her flesh and licked her blood. I'm telling you, this is a great story to tell your children around Halloween, okay? Uh, <laughs> But it is this incredible story how God's prophecy was fulfilled down to the my minutest of details. So anyway, so after that, you have this series of, by the way, Jehu fell because, and, and no sooner had he had this wonderful success, that he does something so cruel and against God's word that he lives now in disobedience to what God wanted him to do. You know, one, sometimes we often go, you know, in the business world, people will study the failures of businesses to learn why they didn't succeed. Well, on the way back from a trip this past week, I was reading in Harvard Business Review where companies and uh, people in academia are flipping that around. They want to study what makes people successful because we often wait until we fail to see why we failed and never go back to what we were doing when we were successful. And when Jehu was successful or any prophet of God or any person of God in the Old Testament, it was always because God was number one, they would passionately follow the will of God and, and they would lead others to follow the will of God as well. And God put it this way or Jesus put it this way in the New Testament, you know, love God, love others, and, and go to all the world and make disciples. And so by the time you get to 2 Kings 22, um, Hoshea is the last king of Israel. It falls, it's demise, it's over. And Judah is the only kingdom left standing from the original millions of folks that Moses led out of Egypt uh, hundreds of years before. It's a tragic story that didn't have to happen if they would have obeyed God and followed him. It's great reading. Keep reading this week. Going to the New Testament. Yes, sir. So um, I have Acts chapter 17 through Acts chapter 21 verse uh, through uh, 36. So in Acts chapter 17, we have um, Paul and Silas. Silas is a, uh, I guess, a church leader within the community and he's traveling with Paul doing missionary work and so around this time this is around like the second journey second to third journey as we in this frame chapter that we have that they're traveling but they travel it's approximately that they said they travel approximately a hundred miles from Philippi to Thessalonica which is about three a three-day walk so um, that's that's a lot of walking and you know they didn't have vehicles or stuff like that and so they walk but Paul knew that Thessalonica was a really uh, good area for ministry because it was um, for the Lord because it was a capital, not only was it the capital of Macedonia, but it was also a center for business and it was located on several important trade routes. So this helped out, you know, when Paul preached the gospel to people, they would hear it and maybe those who were traveling around that they will also hear the gospel. And you know, let me just jump in there real quick because you're making a great point. Paul, Paul didn't necessarily... Uh, if he was led of the Lord, he'd go to the real small towns, but he went to the metropolitan areas or the areas like what you were saying where there was major crossroads mm -hmm. or ports where people were coming in and out, trans, uh, transition of people groups, migration, transient people groups were going through. And it was there that he would spread the gospel to the Jews first. He'd always go to the synagogue and then to the Gentile people. But I appreciate you bringing the 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 characteristics of the city because that was his mo Athens and uh, any big city they do Thessalonica Ephesus. Corinth Ephesus, uh, yeah. yeah Ephesus yep yeah so um, also the area that was also heavily influenced with Greek uh, philosophers so in Acts chapter seventeen verse eighteen Paul was encountered by Epicureans and Stoics so these are Greek philosophers and all these philosophy being created and um, 
And Paul basically really goes against their theory because at the Epicurean theory at that time, it says the origin of the world by mere coincidence of atoms and Stoics and their doctrine was the divine wisdom and providence creating and ruling all things. So Paul, he's going, he's preaching the gospel. Wait, that, let, let me just kind of, because one was science, mm -hmm. you know, the other was like Star Wars, yeah. may the force be with yeah. you, you know, kind of thing. And, yeah. and we still have those same two extremes in our culture today, taught in universities, just renamed and relabeled. Yeah. In verse 3, we have, you know, that Paul is explaining and proving that it is necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead in saying that Jesus, this Jesus who I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And um, many of the Gentile God-fearers and some of the Jews accepted Paul's interpretation, which some believe that echoes to Isaiah's prophecy of the suffering servant, which could be found in Isaiah 53. Um, and then towards the beginning of, at the end of Isaiah 52. And so, but as they're preaching this gospel, they're kicked out because people didn't like them. Uh, the Jews, some of the Jews were against them. And so they were chased out of the city. But what? That didn't stop them. And what did they do? They went to the next town and continued to preach the gospel. Now, in verse 11, the Jews, uh, we look at verse 11, the Jews, they traveled down to Berea, uh, the Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and they received the word with all eagerness. And I really like this because it's talking about they examined the scriptures daily to see if those things were so. And many of them therefore believed with a few, uh, with not a few Greek women of high standings as well as men. So it's really interesting that believers were making sure that Paul were also, I guess, investigating that, you know, that Paul was basically preaching the truth and not just, you know, hearing it all and then just believing it. So they were somewhat, they were examining the scriptures daily to see if they were true, that Paul was speaking the truth. And many come to believe in that. Um, now shifting as we go into uh, Acts chapter 19, here we have the Apostle Paul traveling, traveling to Ephesus. And now again, because Ephesus was a key city for travel and businesses, it allowed Paul's testimony of Jesus to spread throughout the Roman province of Asia, which is now um, modern day Turkey. So people visiting Ephesus had the opportunity to hear Paul preach the gospel. And those who believe would have then spread the message to various places of people who visit and live. So Paul continued to preach. Um, and verse 10 in chapter 19 tells us that he preached until all the residents of Asia, which is modern day Turkey, heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Gentile. As we go into chapter Acts chapter 21, here... Things start to shift where we're towards like the third journey, um, Paul's third missionary journey. And Paul goes to Jerusalem. And it's interesting because uh, the, some of the, the disciples uh, were with them. I don't know is it the disciples' disciples or different disciples that they were talking about. But he was saying that it was interesting because in verse 21, verse 4, it says, Who is uh, about talking about being led by the Spirit, that they were scared that, um, that Paul was going to Jerusalem, but Paul has been commanded by the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 20, verse 22. Rather than the Spirit giving contradictory message, it may be that the believers, knowing that through the Spirit what will happen to Paul in Jerusalem, and then they worry about the dangers facing Paul there. So Paul is ready to suffer for the gospel, but they do not want him to. So it's kind of a weird thing where people are talking about, is this really the Spirit telling the guys, telling Paul not to go? But Paul has confirmed that the Holy Spirit has commanded him to go to Jerusalem, but he doesn't know what's going to happen after that. But Paul, I'm pretty sure he is going to know that he is going to suffer for the gospel because he's been thrown in prison before um, and all this, um, and escaped from prison. And from Acts chapter 21, um, verses 27 through 36, here we have the Apostle Paul being arrested. And and really speaks about Paul because he is faithfully preaching the gospel to both Jews and Gentiles. So Jews were not happy with that because in verse 28 it says, Crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone, everyone else against the people and the law in this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. Because the Jews thought it was just all about them. But Paul faithfully preaches the gospel to both Jews and Gentiles. Not just the Jews, but the Jews and Gentiles. Gentiles is just this, you know, this another saying that those who weren't Jews. And this brings me to a reminder of Matthew chapter 28, 
in verses 18 through 20, this is where Jesus comes back and he tells the disciples, says, Jesus came and he said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am always with you to the end of the age. Like Paul took this seriously, preaching the gospel to all the ends of the earth and to each and every nation. And in the last part, I think sometimes we forget when Paul's going through this persecution, we're reminded that behold, I am always with you to the end of age. It is amazing that God has guided each and every step of Paul, but Paul also has to faithfully follow those steps. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a great verse you ended up with, you know, from Matthew 28, um, and I'll be with you always. A lot of times we take that verse out of context, yeah. you know, because who's the you in that verse in Matthew 28? Lo, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the world. Well, I think you people will say, well, we broaden it out and that yeah. God is with us always, you know. Specifically in that context, it was people who go and make disciples, you know, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so now the, we start off Paul meeting Paul in the book of Acts, persecuting Christians. Now as we close or get to the close of the book of Acts, Paul is now being persecuted and the singular thing that made the difference, because he knew the teachings of Jesus before, um, you know, his Damascus Road experience. But the thing that made the difference was he had seen the resurrected Jesus Christ. And that's why he went and made disciples, you know. And that's, you know, the promise, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the world. Good job. And in bringing home the wisdom lit. Yeah, today we are in... Uh, Psalms 144 to 150, and then uh, last part of Proverbs 17, and beginning parts of Proverbs 18, specifically through verse 10 there. A um, couple themes we see in uh, Psalms this week, and one we've kind of already alluded to with what you guys have shared, but just kind of that uh, that focus of God being number one. Um, a lot of times when we hear that, that phrase, like knowing your place, or being put in your place, it's a negative thing, but I think as believers, knowing our place in relationship to our Savior is a very, very good thing, an encouraging thing. Um, we see a little bit of that here in yeah. chapter 144, starting in verse 3. It says, uh, and this is David, it says, Lord, what is man that you take knowledge of him, or the son of man that you are mindful of him? Man is like a breath. His days are like a passing shadow. Bow down your heavens, O Lord, and come down, touch the mountains, and they shall smoke. And so we see just a huge difference there, how quick and how fleeting and how finite we are as humans, but how vast and how powerful and how great God is as, as God. Um, and he continues this on in chapter 145. We go to verse 8 and 9. It says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. And so again, that knowing that God is number one, he is, he is so much more, he is creator, he is savior, he is, he is all of that. Man, I think it's good and it's encouraging as a believer to know that no, he is over all, he is far more than me, but at the same time, we see in these passages that he cares for me, and it's so incredibly humbling to think about the creator of the universe, creator of all things, creator of you, creator of me, still cares, truly cares, and is patient, and is gracious, and is compassionate, and is full of mercy towards me, and towards you, and towards all of creation. Uh, we see that even continue on in the next chapter, in chapter 146. And I love, love, love this part, specifically verse 1 through 7, uh, but even more specific, 3 through 6 here. He says, do not put your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, nor in a Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His spirit departs, he returns to his earth. In that very day, his plans perish. Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose help is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps truth forever. And Ying and I talked about this a little bit with our students just the other night at, at a life group, but just this idea of, 
there are so many voices, there are so many distractions, there are so many things trying to pull us to, no, look at this, no, listen to this, no, watch this, no, follow this, no, go in this direction. And he makes a great point here that if we put our hope, if we put our trust, if we put our faith in anybody other than Jesus, it is so fleeting. Those, those plans perish that very day. They are so, so fleeting. But mm -hmm. when we put our hope in the Lord, we have hope, we have faith in knowing, we have trust in knowing that He is greater, the maker of heavens and earth. He keeps truth forever. And I love that word forever. forever. Because it's not That's just, word. oh, it's true now, or this is true for you, or this is true for something. No, this is truth that is lasting for forever. It's been from the beginning, and it'll be to the very end, and through all, our, through all eternity, um, that truth is forever. And so we can stand firm in that. Um, we can put our faith in Him, and we can put our trust, trust and our hope in Him. Uh, as we continue the last part of Psalms, we see lots, lots, lots of Psalms of praise, specifically in chapter 148 and 150. Almost all the verses there start with praise Him. Um, 148, it's talking about all of creation. So it's talking about, you know, uh, I'll just turn there. Praise him, all his angel, all his hosts, the sun, the moon, the stars, the light, the heavens, all of these. Praise him, praise him, praise him. Um, so talking about all of creation, we'll praise him. And then chapter 150, talking about different ways. It says, praise him in his, uh, in his mighty commitment. Uh, praise him for his mighty acts, according to his excellent greatness. Uh, Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the lute and heart. So just all these different ways of praising the Lord. And so I encourage you to read that chapter 147 through 150 in all these ways. We know that he is worthy of praise, but I think it's good for us to read and see that, man, all of creation praise him. And there's different ways to praise him and worship him. Uh, we move into Proverbs chapter 17 and 18. And just a couple nuggets of wisdom here that all kind of tie together that I want us to look at. The very end of chapter 17, specifically verse 27, it says, He who has knowledge spares his words, and a man of understanding is a calm spirit. Um, other translations say is cool-headed or shows restraint. Okay, talk about restraining from, from our words there. Uh, then you go down to chapter 18, verses 4 and 8. It says, the words of a man's mouth are deep waters. The wellspring of wisdom is a flowing brook. And if you go to chapter 8, the words of a talebearer, or in other translations, gossipers, are like tasty trifles. And they go down into the inmost body. Our words truly, truly matter. And we see that throughout Proverbs. Specifically, we see it here in these few verses here. What we say, what we do, how we mm -hmm. act, all of that matters day in and day out. And and again, we cannot, we wish we could, but we cannot make somebody accept salvation. We cannot make somebody put their faith in Jesus. We cannot force that. But we can live consistently. And I think one of the biggest ways day in and day out is what are you saying? What are you saying with your words? What are you saying with your actions? What are you saying with your life? Are you living consistently? So even though you can't force somebody's salvation, you can't force somebody into faith, when they look at you, do they see somebody who day in and day out, words, actions, deeds are lighting up and they are living consistently with God and for God each and every day, pointing them to Christ. And so I think that's that's what we're to do each and every day. That it? That's it. Good stuff. That's, that's Good stuff. Doing. So... Happy 26th podcast. Happy reading through the Bible through a year. And I've got a great idea, Clayton, for this three-minute uh, Yang hot dog competition oh thing. Goodness. What about Friday night of vacation Bible school? Oh, oh, to cap it off, goodness. he takes on all challengers. Three minutes. <laughs> hot dogs, buns, that's it. Yep. A little water water to drink. Some, some grill masters ready to cook hot dogs. Yeah, yeah, we get Scott, you know, we get some some guys ready to do that. And uh, I think it's got possibilities. I think huge. huge, huge. So if you'd like to take Yang on Friday night of our 
our of our <laughs> VBS. Got a couple weeks to prep. Got a couple weeks to prep. Got a couple weeks to get in shape, and uh, <laughs> we're out of shape. <laughs> we're out of shape. <laughs> I don't know what that looks like. <laughs> <laughs> Whichever one you want to be, and uh, that will be a lot of fun. God bless you. Keep reading the holy scriptures of God's wonderful and amazing Word, because it's just as real to us today as it was in the day that it was written. God bless.